if I told you that we can illuminate a major problem in healthcare, such as the treatment of depression, but using only social media data, what would you say? I can imagine that you would say, wait a minute, are you proposing us to use these platforms where users upload their best selfies using beauty camera to study a problem as deep and complex as depression? Are you serious? You're probably imagining that I'm kind of a hopeless, crazy scientist that is trying to accomplish the impossible, right? Well, even though I'm a computer scientist, treatment of depression has been on my mind for many, many years. It all started when I was a, a teaching a course at a major university in the United States. I was teaching an introductory course with hundreds of students. These students were freshmen, mostly, just out of high school, having their first college experience. As the semester developed, something very interesting started to happen very, very often. The students started approaching me, but not to talk about the course. They wanted to talk about their emotions. And a typical conversation would go like, hi, professor, um, I can't keep up with the pace of this course. I'm getting extremely anxious, and my anxiety is preventing me from thinking clearly. Not being able to think clearly led to depression, and now depression is affecting my whole life. Very fast, these students found themselves in this vicious cycle, and they couldn't get back on track. Mental health is a widespread problem on campuses throughout the world. One particular case caught my attention. This young man that comes from a poor country in Africa approached me, and when he started telling me about his problem, I started getting really, really worried. He said, I came from a village, and people from this village made sacrifices to pay for my tuition for me to come to this prestigious university. I'm not getting good grades, and I can't st even start imagining what's going to happen to me if I go back to my country with these grades. Failing, he said, is not an option for me. I started imagining what it feels like to be part of a minority group in this highly competitive environment and subject to this great deal of pressure. I looked in his eyes and noticed that he was about to make something, do something stupid, such as take his own life. I offered as much help as I could. Uh, in fact, we spent a, a number of hours studying together. A few weeks later, when he saw his final exam, to our surprise, he got perfect score. Unfortunately, not because he mastered the material and uh, did well on the exam, but in his desperation to do well, he got a hold of the solution somehow and copied them word by word to this, his exam. I was in a room where the graders were looking at his exam, and you can't imagine the fury in their eyes, and I saw absolutely no compassion. At that point, I knew that George was in real danger. Before something tragic happened, though, I was able to direct George to the campus clinic in which he started treating with antidepressants. Now the story starts to get interesting. Instead of coming back energized and feeling well, George had to take a leave of absence because he started feeling worse. He started feeling more removed, apathetic, with impaired cognition. And I started wondering, how come a medication that is supposed to alleviate the symptoms of depression actually exacerbates those symptoms? Over the years, I became a volunteer to help students 
experience mental health issues to direct them to the right treatment on campus. And I observed this, the same pattern over and over again. Students had to take a break to deal with the side effects of the medication. I start getting interested in this problem, and I wonder, can I use my skills to make progress in this, in this uh, direction? Because from a computational perspective, if I had all this data, patient data, treatment data, medication data, I could put everything in a computational model, and I can predict if there is a pattern that some medications work well for certain kinds of people. I can predict, hopefully with high accuracy, what's the best treatment for each patient. Problem solved, right? Well, not really. Even if this approach worked, I would never know. Due to privacy regulations, it would be virtually impossible for me to have all this data. But I was obsessed about making progress in this direction, and I wonder, how can I make progress? I read a piece of research that says that artificial intelligence was able to detect signs of stress just by looking at people's text. Better, they did that better than clinicians. And I said, if mental health is associated with language, can we go online and then observe all these users talking about their symptoms and treatments and learn from all this user population? Because if you think about it, the way we know about antidepressants is mostly from clinical trials. In clinical trials, before the drug goes to the market, researchers divide a random group of volunteers into two groups, a treatment group that receives the medication and a control group that receives a sugar pill without any medicine content. The effectiveness of the treatment is based on the difference between the two groups after medication intake. Clinical trials have many limitations, but even well-designed clinical trials surfer, surf, surfers from a limited population and limited time span, usually a few hundred users, for a few weeks or a few months. Then I start asking myself if we can go to social media and track these users for a really long time. Can we extend these clinical trials from a few weeks or a few months to potentially many years, from a few users, a few hundred users, to thousands and potentially millions of users? If I could do that, that would be very powerful. I started talking about this with my colleagues, and to our disappointment, we came up with a list of limitations of this data. For example, this data has a sample problem. Not every user of antidepressant is there using social media. And even those who are on social media, they're not talking about their, their treatment because there's a stigma associated with mental health. We have a problem of spotty monitoring because we can only observe a user when they post something online. Lots of limitations that was a huge setback for us. But then we start thinking again and saying, this data actually have lots of advantages as well. First of all, it's completely publicly available. It's low cost. It's high scale. And it's non-intrusive. And we also can follow the users in their natural social media environment instead of putting them in an artificial environment in a laboratory. So together with my colleagues from Georgia Tech, Microsoft Research, and Harvard Medical School of Psychiatry, we did just that. We tried to make Twitter into a giant clinical trial on the web. Here's what we did. First, we trained a machine to identify the users, the language of the users who are taking an antidepressant, who self-reported taking an antidepressant. 
Then we go to Twitter and try to identify those users. We were able to find 30,000 users in this situation, and we got their whole history for two years. That accounted for over 100 million tweets. Then we start to estimate when they start taking the medication, and that allows us to analyze their behavior before and after treatment. Now, to approximate this as a control, uh, clinical trial, what we did was to learn this depressive language from this group before treatment and go back to Twitter using machine learning to find similar users that have this kind of the same depressive language, but they're not mentioning any medication intake. So we found 30, 300,000 users, which accounted for 700 million tweets. How do we analyze these users? We're now going to look at every tweet and try to extract emotion from these tweets. For example, we use artificial intelligence techniques uh, related to natural language processing to see a tweet like this and, for example, looking at the word suffering. Suffering is a feeling. Feeling is an emotion. We collect all the emotions from the tweets, we process them, and then we characterize every tweet into different categories. Negative effect, depression, cognition, and so on. Let me tell you about our results. Our results were astounding. Here I'm showing you in the horizontal axis the different antidepressants. And the vertical axis, I'm showing you the different emotional outcomes. A red square means that that antidepressant made the symptoms worse with respect to that emotion. And a green square means that there was an improvement. We learned three important things from this experiment. First, to our surprise, users who self-reported taking a medication had a difference between before and after taking the medication. And we didn't see that change in the control group. That was great, because our experiment is working. We see the signal. Second, similar medications that have similar chemical composition and belong to the same family affected users in similar ways. We saw some consistency consistency in our experiment. Third, as you can see here, most of the squares are red, meaning that modern antidepressants are associated with worsening of the symptoms, whereas first-generation antidepressants are associated with improvement. We have a long way until we establish the clinical validity of this experiment. But imagine what this could enable if we could combine this kind of framework with expert advice and work on regulations and privacy. What can we do? Let's go back to the story of George. If we have this mechanism back then, we could track students' emotions in real time. And maybe we could prevent students like George and many others from suffering and from potentially causing harm to themselves. These days, there is a heated discussion about privacy, which is a very important uh, concern. On the other hand, without data, there's no AI. And I believe that there should be a dialogue between researchers and regulators so that we can make progress. But in any case, what I just showed you here today is that even the data that is publicly available, data that people like you and me can collect, can still be useful for making powerful discoveries and for making progress in important problems in our society. So I'm here to encourage you, let's go out and use your imagination and data to have an impact in the world. Thank you.